Book One, Part Two of the Republic, by Plato, read by Bob Niffeld. When we had got to this point in the argument, and every one saw that the definition of justice had been completely upset, Trasimachus, instead of replying to me, said, "Tell me, Socrates, have you got a nurse?" "'Why do you ask such a question,' I said, "'when you ought rather to be answering? "'Because she leaves you to snivel, and never wipes your nose. "'She has not even taught you to know the shepherd from the sheep.' "'What makes you say that?' I replied. "'Because you fancy that the shepherd or neat herd "'fattens or tends the sheep or oxen with a view to their own good, "'and not to the good of himself or his master. "'And you further imagine that the rulers of states if they are true rulers, never think of their subjects as sheep, and that they are not studying their own advantage day and night. Oh, no! And so entirely astray are you in your ideas about the just and unjust, as not even to know that justice and the just are in reality another's good. That is to say, the interest of the ruler and stronger, and the loss of the subject and the servant. And in justice the opposite, for the unjust is lord over the truly simple and just. He is the stronger, and his subjects do what is for his interests and minister to his happiness, which is very far from being their own. Consider further, most foolish Socrates, that the just is always a loser in comparison with the unjust. First of all, in private contracts. Wherever the unjust is the partner of the just, you will find that, when the partnership is dissolved, the unjust man has always more and the just less. Secondly, in their dealings with the state, when there is an income tax, the just man will pay more and the unjust less on the same amount of income. And when there is anything to be received, the one gains nothing and the other much. Observe also what happens when they take an office. There is the just man neglecting his affairs, and perhaps suffering other losses, and getting nothing out of the public, because he is just. Moreover, he is hated by his friends and acquaintances for refusing to serve them in unlawful ways. But all this is reversed in the case of the unjust man. I am speaking, as before, of injustice on a large scale, in which the advantage of the unjust is most apparent and my meaning will be most clearly seen if we turn to that highest form of injustice in which the criminal is the happiest of men, and the sufferers, or those who refuse to do injustice, are the most miserable, that is to say, tyranny, which by fraud and force takes away the property of others, not little by little, but wholesale, comprehending in one things sacred, as well as profane, private, and public for which acts of wrong, if he were detected perpetrating any of them singly, he would be punished and incur great disgrace. They who do such wrong in particular cases are called robbers of temples, and man-stealers, and burglars, and swindlers, and thieves. But when a man, besides taking away the money of the citizens, has made slaves of them, then, instead of these names of reproach, he is termed happy and blessed and not only by the citizens, but by all who hear of his having achieved the consummation of injustice. For mankind censure injustice, fearing that they may be the victims of it, and not because they shrink from committing it. And thus I have shown Socrates injustice, when on a sufficient scale, has more strength and freedom and mastery than justice, and, as I said, at first, justice is the interest of a stronger whereas injustice is a man's own profit and interest. Trisimachus, when he had thus spoken, having, like a bathman, deluged our ears with his words, had a mind to go away. But the company would not let him. They insisted that he should remain and defend his position, and I myself added my own humble request that he would not leave us. Trisimachus, I said to him, excellent man, how suggestive are your remarks! and are you going to run away before you have fairly taught and learned whether they are true or not? Is the attempt to determine the way of man's life so small a matter in your eyes to determine how life may be passed by each one of us to the greatest advantage? 
"'And do I differ from you?' he said, as to the importance of the inquiry. "'You appear, rather,' I replied, "'to have no care or thought about us, Trasimachus, whether we live better or worse from not knowing what you say you know is to you a matter of indifference. Pray thee, friend, do not keep your knowledge to yourself. We are a large party, and any benefit which you confer upon us will be amply rewarded. For my own part, I openly declare that I am not convinced, and that I do not believe in justice to be more gainful than justice, even if uncontrolled and allowed to have free play. For, granting that there may be an unjust man who is able to commit injustice either by fraud or force, still this does not convince me of the superior advantage of injustice, and there may be others who are in the same predicament as myself. Perhaps we may be wrong. If so, you, in your wisdom, should convince us that we are mistaken in preferring justice to injustice. And how am I to convince you, he said, if you are not already convinced by what I have just said? What more can I do for you? Would you have me put the proof bodily into your souls? Heaven forbid, I said. I would only ask you to be consistent, or, if you change, change openly, and let there be no deception. For I must remark, Thrasymachus, if you will recall what was previously said, that although you began by defining the true physician in an exact sense, you do not observe a like exactness when speaking of the shepherd. You thought that the shepherd, as a shepherd, tends the sheep not with a view to their own good, but more like a diner or banqueter with a view to the pleasures of the table, or, again, as a trader for sale in the market, and not as a shepherd. Yet surely the art of the shepherd is concerned only with the good of his subjects. He has only to provide the best for them, since the perfection of the art is already ensured whenever all the requirements of it are satisfied. And that was what I was saying just now about the ruler. I conceive that the art of the ruler, considered as ruler, whether in a state or in private life, can only regard the good of his flock or subjects, whereas you seem to think that the rulers in states, that is to say, the true rulers, like being in authority. Think? Nay, I am sure of it. Then why, in the case of lesser offices, do men never take them willingly without payment, unless under the idea that they govern for the advantage not of themselves, but of others? Let me ask you a question. Are not the several arts different, by reason of their each having a separate function? And, my dear illustrious friend, do say what you think, that we may make a little progress. Yes, that is the difference, he replied and each art gives us a particular good, and not merely a general one. Medicine, for example, gives us health, navigation, safety at sea, and so on. Yes, he said. And the art of payment has the special function of giving pay, but we do not confuse this with other arts, any more than the art of the pilot is to be confused with the art of medicine, because the health of the pilot may be improved by a sea voyage. You would not be inclined to say, would you, that navigation is the art of medicine, at least if we are to adopt your exact use of language? Certainly not. Or, because a man is in good health when he receives pay, you would not say that the art of payment is medicine? I should not. Nor would you say that medicine is the art of receiving pay, because a man takes fees when he is engaged in healing? Certainly not. And we have admitted, I said, that the good of each art is specially confined to the art? Yes. Then, if there be any good which all artists have in common, that is to be attributed to something of which they all have the common use? True, he replied. And when the artist is benefited by receiving pay, the advantage is gained by an additional use of the art of pay, which is not the art professed by him. He gave a reluctant assent to this. Then the pay is not derived by the several artists from their respective arts. But the truth is that while the art of medicine gives health, and the art of the builder builds a house, another art attends them, which is the art of pay. 
the various arts may be doing their own business and benefiting that over which they preside but would the artist receive any benefit from his art unless he were paid as well i suppose not but does he therefore confer no benefit when he works for nothing certainly he confers a benefit then now trisemachus there is no longer any doubt that neither arts nor governments provide for their own interests but as we were before saying they rule and provide for the interests of their subjects who are the weaker and not the stronger to their good they attend and not to the good of the superior and this is the reason my dear trisemachus why as i was just now saying no one is willing to govern because no one likes to take in hand the reformation of evils which are not his concern without remuneration for in the execution of his work and in giving his orders to another the true artist does not regard his own interest but always that of his subjects and therefore in order that rulers may be willing to rule they must be paid in one of three modes of payment money or honour or a penalty for refusing what do you mean socrates said glaucon the first two modes of payment are intelligible enough but what the penalty is i do not understand and how a penalty can be a payment you mean that you do not understand the nature of this payment which to the best man is the great inducement to rule of course you know that ambition and avarice are held to be as indeed they are a disgrace very true and for this reason i said money and honour have no attraction for them good men do not wish to be openly demanding payment for governing and so to get the name of hirelings nor by secretly helping themselves out of the public revenues to get the name of thieves and not being ambitious they do not care about honour wherefore necessity must be laid upon them and they must be induced to serve from the fear of punishment and this as i imagine is the reason why the forwardness to take office instead of waiting to be compelled has been deemed dishonourable now the worst part of the punishment is that he who refuses to rule is liable to be ruled by one who is worse than himself and the fear of this as i conceive induces the good to take office not because they would but because they cannot help not under the idea that they are going to have any benefit or enjoyment themselves but as a necessity and because they are not to commit the task of ruling to any one who is better than themselves or indeed as good for there is reason to think that if a city were composed entirely of good men then to avoid office would be as much an object of contention as to obtain office is at present then we should have plain proof that the true ruler is not bent by nature to regard his own interest but that of his subjects and every one who knew this would choose rather to receive a benefit from another than to have the trouble of conferring one so far am i from agreeing with trisemachus that justice is the interest of the stronger this latter question need not be further discussed at present but when Trasimachus says that the life of the unjust is more advantageous than that of the just, his new statement appears to me to be of a far more serious character. Which of us has spoken truly, and which sort of life, Glaucon, do you prefer? I, for my part, deem the life of the just to be the more advantageous, he answered. Do you hear all the advantages of the unjust which Trasimachus was rehearsing? yes i heard him he replied but he has not convinced me then shall we try to find some way of convincing him if we can that he is saying what is not true most certainly he replied if i said he makes a set speech and we make another recounting all the advantages of being just and he answers and we rejoin there must be a numbering and measuring of the goods which are claimed on either side and in the end we shall want judges to decide but if we proceed in our inquiry as we lately did by making admissions to one another we shall unite the offices of judge and advocate in our own persons very good he said and which method do i understand you to prefer i said that which you propose well then trasimachus 
I said. Suppose you begin at the beginning and answer me. You say that perfect injustice is more gainful than perfect justice. Yes, that is what I say, and I have given you my reasons. And what is your view about them? Would you call one of them virtue and the other vice? Certainly. I suppose that you would call justice virtue and injustice vice. What a charming notion! So likely, too, seeing that I affirm injustice to be profitable and justice not. What else, then, would you say? The opposite, he replied. And would you call justice vice? No, I would rather say sublime simplicity. Then would you call injustice malignity? No, I would rather say discretion. And do the unjust appear to you to be wise and good? Yes, he said. At any rate, those of them who are able to be perfectly unjust, and who have the power of subduing states and nations, but perhaps you imagine me to be talking of cut-purses. Even this profession, if undetected, has advantages, though they are not to be compared with those of which I was just now speaking. I do not think that I misapprehend your meaning, Trasimachus, I replied, but still I cannot hear without amazement that you class injustice with wisdom and virtue, and justice with the opposite. Certainly I do so class them. Now, I said, you are on more substantial and almost unanswerable ground, for if the injustice which you were maintaining to be profitable had been admitted by you as by others to be vice and deformity, an answer might have been given to you on received principles. But now I perceive that you will call injustice honorable and strong, and to the unjust you will attribute all the qualities which are attributed by us before to the just seeing that you do not hesitate to rank injustice with wisdom and virtue. You have guessed most infallibly, he replied. Then I certainly ought not to shrink from going through the argument, so long as I have reason to think that you, Trasimachus, are speaking your real mind. For I do believe that you are now in earnest, and are not amusing yourself at our expense. I may be in earnest or not, but what is that to you? To refute the argument is your business. Very true, I said. That is what I have to do. But will you be so good as to answer yet one more question? Does the just man try to gain any advantage over the just? Far otherwise. If he did, he would not be the simple, amusing creature which he is. And would he try to go beyond just action? He would not. And how would he regard the attempt to gain an advantage over the unjust? Would that be considered by him as just or unjust? He would think it just, and would try to gain the advantage, but he would not be able. Whether he would or would not be able, I said, is not the point. My question is only whether the just man, while refusing to have more than another just man, would wish and claim to have more than the unjust. Yes, he would. And what of the unjust? Does he claim to have more than the just man, and to do more than is just? Of course, he said, for he claims to have more than all men. And the unjust man will strive and struggle to obtain more than the unjust man or action, in order that he may have more than all? True. We may put the matter thus, I said. The just does not desire more than his like, but more than his unlike, for as the unjust desires more than both his like and his unlike, nothing, he said, can be better than that statement. And the unjust is good and wise, and the just is neither. Good again, he said. And is not the unjust like the wise and good, and the just unlike them? Of course, he said. He who is of a certain nature is like those who are of a certain nature. He who is not, not. Each of them, I said, is such as his like is. Certainly, he replied. Very good, Trasimachus, I said. And now to take the case of the arts. You would admit that one man is a musician and another not a musician. Yes. And which is wise and which is foolish? Clearly the musician is wise, and he who is not a musician is foolish. 
and he is good in as far as he is wise and bad in as far as he is foolish yes and you would say the same sort of thing of the physician yes and do you think my excellent friend that a musician when he adjusts the lyre would desire or claim to exceed or go beyond a musician in the tightening and loosening the strings i do not think that he would but he would claim to exceed the non-musician of course and what would you say of the physician in prescribing meats and drinks would he wish to go beyond another physician or beyond the practice of medicine he would not but he would wish to go beyond the non-physician yes and about knowledge and ignorance in general see whether you think that any man who has knowledge ever would wish to have the choice of saying or doing more than another man who has knowledge would he not rather say or do the same as his like in the same case that i suppose could hardly be denied and what of the ignorant would he not desire to have more than either the knowing or the ignorant i dare say and the knowing is wise yes and the wise is good true then the wise and good will not desire to gain more than his like but more than his unlike and opposite i suppose so whereas the bad and ignorant will desire to gain more than both yes but did we not say trasimachus that the unjust goes beyond both his like and unlike were not these your words they were and you also said that the just will not go beyond his like but his unlike yes then the just is like the wise and good and the unjust like the evil and ignorant that is the inference and each of them is such as his like is that was admitted then the just has turned out to be wise and good and the unjust evil and ignorant Trasimachus made all these admissions, not fluently, as I repeat them, but with extreme reluctance. It was a hot summer's day, and the perspiration poured from him in torrents. And then I saw what I had never seen before, Trasimachus blushing. As we were now agreed that justice was virtue and wisdom, and injustice vice and ignorance, I proceeded to another point. Well, I said, Chrysimachus, that matter is now settled. But were we not also saying that injustice had strength? Do you remember? Yes, I remember, he said. But do not suppose that I approve of what you are saying, or have no answer. If, however, I were to answer, you would be quite certain to accuse me of haranguing. Therefore, either permit me to have my say out, or, if you would rather ask, do so and i will answer very good as they say to story-telling old women and will nod yes and no certainly not i said if contrary to your real opinion yes he said i will to please you since you will not let me speak what else would you have nothing in the world i said and if you are so disposed i will ask and you shall answer proceed then i will repeat the question which i asked before in order that our examination of the relative nature of justice and injustice may be carried on regularly a statement was made that injustice is stronger and more powerful than justice but now justice having been identified with wisdom and virtue is easily shown to be stronger than injustice if injustice is ignorance this can no longer be questioned by any one but i want to view the matter trasimachus in a different way you would not deny that a state may be unjust and may be unjustly attempting to enslave other states or may have already enslaved them and may be holding many of them in subjection true he replied and i will add that the best and most perfectly unjust state would be most likely to do so i know i said that such was your position but what i would further consider is whether this power which is possessed by the superior state can exist or be exercised without justice or only with justice if you are right in your view and justice is wisdom then only with justice but if i am right then without justice 
I am delighted, Trasimachus, to see you not only nodding assent and dissent, but making answers which are quite excellent. That is out of civility to you, he replied. You are very kind, I said, and would you have the goodness also to inform me whether you think that a state, or an army, or a band of robbers and thieves, or any other gang of ill-doers, could act at all if they injured one another? No, indeed, he said, they could not. But if they abstain from injuring one another, then they might act together better? Yes. And this is because injustice creates divisions and hatreds and fighting, and justice imparts harmony and friendship. Is not that true, Trasimachus? I agree, he said, because I do not wish to quarrel with you. How good of you, I said. But I should like to know also whether injustice, having this tendency to arouse hatred, wherever existing, among slaves or among freemen, will not make them hate one another and set them at variance and render them incapable of common action. Certainly. And even if injustice be found in two only, will they not quarrel and fight, and become enemies to one another and to the just? They will. And suppose injustice abiding in a single person, would your wisdom say that she loses or that she retains her natural power? Well, let us assume that she retains her power. Yet is not the power which injustice exercises of such a nature that wherever she takes up her abode, whether in a city, in an army, in a family, or in any other body, that body is, to begin with, rendered incapable of united action by reason of sedition and distraction, and does it not become its own enemy, and at variance with all that opposes it, and with the just? Is not this the case? Yes, certainly. And is not injustice equally fatal when existing in a single person, in the first place rendering him incapable of action because he is not at unity with himself, and in the second place making him an enemy to himself and the just? Is not that true, Trasimachus? Yes. And, O oh, my friend, I said, surely the gods are just? Granted that they are. But if so, the unjust will be the enemy of the gods, and the just will be their friend. Feast away in triumph, and take your fill of the argument. I will not oppose you, lest I should displease the company. Well, then, proceed with your answers, and let me have the remainder of my repast. For we have already shown that the just are clearly wiser and better and abler than the unjust, and that the unjust are incapable of common action. Nay, more, that to speak as we did of men who are evil acting at any time vigorously together is not strictly true. For if they had been perfectly evil, they would have laid hands upon one another. But it is evident that there must have been some remnant of justice in them which enabled them to combine. If there had not been, they would have injured one another as well as their victims. They were but half-villains in their enterprises, for had they been whole villains and utterly unjust, they would have been utterly incapable of action. That, as I believe, is the truth of the matter, and not what you said at first. But whether the just have a better and happier life than the unjust is a further question which we also propose to consider. I think that they have, and for the reasons which I have given. But still, I should like to examine further, for no light matter is at stake, nothing less than the rule of human life. Proceed. I will proceed by asking a question. Would you not say that a horse has some end? I should. And the end or use of a horse or of anything would be that which could not be accomplished, or not so well accomplished, by any other thing. I do not understand, he said. Let me explain. Can you see except with the eye? Certainly not. Or hear except with the ear? No. These, then, may be truly said to be the ends of these organs. They may but you can cut off a vine branch with a dagger or with a chisel, and in many other ways, of course, and yet not so well as with a pruning-hook made for the purpose. True. 
May we not say that this is the end of a pruning-hook? We may. Then now I think you will have no difficulty in understanding my meaning, when I asked the question whether the end of anything would be that which could not be accomplished, or not so well accomplished, by any other thing. I understand your meaning, he said, and assent. And that to which an end is appointed has also an excellence. Need I ask again whether the eye has an end? It has, and has not the eye an excellence? Yes. And the ear has an end and an excellence also? True. And the same is true of all other things. They have each of them an end and a special excellence. That is so. Well, and can the eyes fulfill their end if they are wanting in their own proper excellence and have a defect instead? Oh, how can they, he said, if they are blind and cannot see? You mean to say, if they have lost their proper excellence, which is sight, but I have not arrived at that point yet. I would rather ask the question more generally, and only inquire whether the things which fulfill their ends fulfill them by their own proper excellence, and fail of fulfilling them by their own defect. Certainly, he replied. I might say the same of the ears. When deprived of their own proper excellence, they cannot fulfill their end. True. And the same observation will apply to all other things? I agree. Well, and has not the soul an end which nothing else can fulfill? For example, to superintend and command and deliberate and the like. Are not these functions proper to the soul, and can they rightly be assigned to any other? To no other. And is not life to be reckoned among the ends of the soul? Assuredly, he said. And has not the soul an excellence also? Yes. And can she, or can she not, fulfill her own ends when deprived of that excellence? She cannot. Then an evil soul must necessarily be an evil ruler and superintendent, and the good soul a good ruler. Yes, necessarily. And we have admitted that justice is the excellence of the soul, and injustice the defect of the soul. That has been admitted. Then the just soul and the just man will live well and the unjust man will live ill, that is what your argument proves. And he who lives well is blessed and happy, and he who lives ill the reverse of happy. Certainly. Then the just is happy, and the unjust miserable. So be it. But happiness, and not misery, is profitable. Of course. Then, my blessed Trisimachus, Injustice can never be more profitable than justice. Let this, Socrates, he said, be your entertainment at the Bendidia. For which I am indebted to you, I said, now that you have grown gentle towards me and have left off scolding. Nevertheless, I have not been well entertained, but that was my own fault and not yours. As an epicure snatches a taste of every dish which is successively brought to table, he not having allowed himself time to enjoy the one before, so have I gone from one subject to another without having discovered what I sought at first, the nature of justice. I left that inquiry and turned away to consider whether justice is virtue and wisdom, or evil and folly, and when there arose a further question about the comparative advantages of justice and injustice, I could not refrain from passing on to that. And the result of the whole discussion has been that I know nothing at all. For I know not what justice is, and therefore I am not likely to know whether it is or is not a virtue. Nor can I say whether the just man is happy or unhappy. End of Book One